Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Dana Trupiana, and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out on Tuesdays. Well, it's Tuesday, so here I am. Okay, so we are on part two of O.J. Simpson, and as I said last time, we are going to be going over every single theory that I could find on this case, and there is a lot. First, I want to go over all the reasons why everybody, especially the prosecution in this case, was convinced without a shadow of a doubt that it was OJ that actually murdered his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ron Goldman. The completion of the film, Frogman, gave us a glimpse into what OJ was up to in the weeks that were leading up to the tragic murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. So Frogmen was a movie that was supposed to go straight to TV, and then it was supposed to be a TV show that branched off from that. And in this movie to TV show, Simpson played Bullfrog Burke, who led a team of ex-Navy SEALs on daring missions that were ordered both by the private and the public sector. It was kind of like the A-Team, and it was full of action and adventure, and that was all the rage back then. Like, that is what people wanted to see on TV. Simpson even went through military training to get his role down, like, pat. It was supposed to be perfect. And in that military training, he learned all kinds of survival training, including how to handle and fight with a knife. The idea was to make his character seem like a real Navy SEAL and make those action scenes look as legit as they possibly could. There's a scene in this series where Simpson's character holds a knife to a woman's throat, and the woman was actually playing his daughter. And that sounds kind of wild. So in the show, a woman enters his house, and he believes that this woman is an intruder. It turns out that the woman that entered his house is actually his daughter, but he realizes this after he grabs her and holds a knife to her throat for like a little bit, like a few seconds. Now, this was all scripted for the show, but knowing what happened happened later, it really just did not age well. Investigators found a 25-minute tape of the pilot at Simpson's house, but the weird part was that when they found the tape, it didn't have the scene with him holding the knife to the woman's throat, which is like super weird, right? Now, with this big trial going on, the trial of the century, this tape is causing a lot of buzz. The defense team tries to stop it from being entered as evidence, but Judge Ito shuts them down and pretty much says like, no, they're fine to show it. They can show it if they want to. Even though it was approved to be used as part of evidence, the prosecution never actually ended up playing this tape in court. I think that the prosecution never used it because it opened a line of questioning. How did they know about this particular tape? Well, police actually put it in the VHS player at OJ's house during the search and watched it to see what was on this tape, which is something that they were absolutely not allowed to do. This would cast even more of a disparaging light on the chop shop of a job that they did in evidence collection in the entire case. So I think it was just easier to discard this piece of evidence altogether than to have to explain why this particular piece of evidence, like so many others on the trial, was mishandled and collected completely incorrectly. It is pretty wild that they didn't end up showing it, though, because the tape was seemingly able to prove that OJ had undergone a lot of training with wielding a knife in preparation for this role. They did discuss the movie and the TV series in court, but they never ended up showing it. And that means that the audience could not get a full picture of what this movie and TV series would have been. They started talking about this character named Bullfrog Burke. Apparently, he has got some serious skills, like being a pro at night killings using his silent kill move where he slashes throats. Again, scripted, but did not age well with the crime that he committed. They're throwing around terms like seals and watch caps, and they're trying to connect the dots between the crime scene where Nicole had her throat cut 
And these super tough Navy SEAL guys who wear knit caps, just like the blue knit cap that was found at the scene of the crime next to Goldman, which is like super weird, right? The night of the murders, OJ had a flight to catch from Los Angeles International Airport to Chicago for a golf event that he was playing in. He was all set to leave on the red eye at 11.45 p.m. Now, to make sure that he got there on time, a limo swung by his place, the Rockingham Estate, around 10.25 p.m., which is not that early. Like, that's pretty on time. The driver gets there early because, you know, the rich, they don't wait at airports. But he gets there early just in case there's any traffic or anything else happens. He wants to make sure OJ makes this flight. But when the limo pulls up, it's clear that something is off. The house looks dark and deserted. Seems like nobody's home. The driver decides to give the intercom a buzz around 10.40 p.m., trying to check if OJ is ready to go, and he does not get a response. Now, while the driver's waiting outside, he spots somebody who he swears looks exactly like OJ entering the house through the front door of the house. The lights inside the house go from looking like nobody's there to all the lights are on, and it seems like somebody walked in the house and turned the lights on. Now, even though the driver sees the house number displayed on the curb, he doesn't notice any other cars parked nearby, including OJ's Ford Bronco. And this detail becomes a pretty big deal later on. During the trial, the prosecution points out that OJ's Bronco was found parked by the curb the next morning, so why would the driver not see it if he's looking at the curb and he sees the number of the house on the curb? Now, do you remember Cato Caitlin, the friend that was crashing at OJ's house and the two of them had gone out for what they said at first was McDonald's and then turned out to be Burger King, but then they come back to McDonald's? Well, that friend. We talked about him earlier. Well, he's on the phone with a friend when he hears this weird noise around 10.40 p.m. He describes three distinct thumps against the wall, which freaked him out. He thought it was an earthquake. But being the curious guy he is, Cato Caitlin decides that he's going to go check it out. Instead of heading straight for the noise, which was coming from a dark pathway where the infamous glove was going to be later discovered, he went to the front of the property. And when he does that, he runs into the limo driver who is waiting for OJ there. Caitlin lets the driver onto the property, and a few minutes later, OJ finally comes out of the house, claiming that he had been in the house all along and that he had overslept. Both the limo driver and Caitlin said at some point that during that night, OJ seemed pretty agitated, and he was, like, off. Like, there was just something off about him. Something was wrong, and they didn't know what. Now, things get even weirder on the ride from OJ's house to the airport. OJ starts complaining about the heat, even though, like, it's a really cool night. OJ is sweating, and he opens up all the windows to get some air. Plus, there's this, like, super odd moment with his luggage. The driver loads four bags into the limo, but OJ insists on holding his backpack himself, and he would not let the driver touch it, even though, usually, he would hand over all bags to be loaded into the car. When they get to the airport, only three bags were checked in, and the backpack that he had held onto was nowhere to be found. He never remembered the existence of this backpack when asked later, and nobody has any idea where that fourth bag went or where the backpack went. Later on, a witness that was at the airport said that they saw OJ at the airport tossing stuff into a trash can. Detectives are convinced that this must have been him ditching the evidence, like the murder weapon, which they were never able to find. Like the clothes that he was wearing during the crime, which, again, they were never able to find. And maybe even the shoes that would link him to the scene. So even though OJ is running super behind schedule, he does manage to make his flight and he hops on the plane. When they were questioned about it, both a passenger on the plane as well as the pilot himself, who did have interactions with OJ, both say that they don't notice any cuts or injuries of any kind on his hands during the flight, which is super weird because later on we're going to find out OJ does have a cut on his hand. But it does seem to support his statement that he got the cut later on. 
because the pilot and the passenger, both who had interactions with OJ, swear he had no injuries during the flight. When he gets to Chicago and he gets into his hotel room at the O'Hare Plaza Hotel, things get even weirder. In the hotel room, they found a broken glass, a note with a phone number on it, and the bed sheets in the hotel room have blood all over them. And it manages somehow to get even weirder from there. The hotel manager does remember OJ asking for a band-aid at the front desk because he said he had cut his finger on some pieces of paper. This is extra weird because if you look at the injury to this boy's finger, it is not a paper cut. Like, there is no way, shape, or form that these injuries came from paper the way that OJ is claiming. Don't know how he actually got the injury, but I know it's not from paper. So now, back at home, the LAPD commander, Keith Bushy, sends out detectives Tom Lang, Philip Van Natter, Ron Phillips, and Mark Furman to inform OJ that his ex-wife had been killed, and to ask OJ to come grab the kids from her place where they're at. The kids are upstairs at the house with Nicole and Ron's bodies out front. So they need OJ to come get these kids. When they roll up to OJ's house, obviously there's no one home. OJ is in Chicago, but they don't know that. They're ringing the intercom for a solid half hour, and they're not having any luck whatsoever. They're not getting anybody. They look over, and they notice OJ's car, and they notice that there's something weird about the car. It's parked all weird, and there's blood on the door. Now, obviously, this raises some alarm bells. They're here to tell OJ that his ex-wife had been killed, and you look at somebody's car, and there's blood on it, and it's parked all weird. This is going to change the tone of the visit, like, immediately. Van Natter goes to Furman, and he's like, all right, bud, time to do some Spider-Man shit. And he tells Furman to get them in there. Furman scales the wall, unlocks the gate, and the team rolls in. Now, remember that I said that. Furman is the first person on this property, and he would have had a moment alone on the property. Once they're inside and they're on the property, they have a chat with Cato Caitlin, who tells police that the car belongs to OJ. He has nothing to do with it. He has nothing to do with the blood on it. It's all OJ. And he also tells police about that weird noise that he had heard that he had thought was an earthquake. But it turns out that it wasn't an earthquake. It was just three very loud, distinct thumps. Now, based on this testimony, Furman goes on a little excursion and boom, he finds the bloody glove, the twin to the one that was found next to Ron Goldman's body at Nicole's house. And that's it. The glove is the smoking gun. And as far as the police go, they've got their man. They know what happened. OJ killed Nicole. As soon as they find this glove, they decide that they got to bring OJ in. After the news breaks, OJ's friend, Ron Phillips, calls him up and tells him about Nicole's death, which is wild because usually in murder cases, they won't release any information at all until the family is notified. So it shouldn't matter whether OJ was in Chicago or whether he was a suspect. It shouldn't matter. He should have been made aware of Nicole's death before it broke on the news. There should never have been a chance for somebody to call OJ and tell him that his ex-wife and mother of his children was murdered. But either way, that's the way it goes. Ron Phillips gives him a call and tells him that Nicole had died. And his reaction was a little weird. He is upset when he gets that call, but he's more focused on asking if the kids saw anything. And now, a lot of people found that alarming, but personally, I did not find that alarming at all. I don't find that to be a piece of evidence. I don't think that that sways anything either way. I think that people read into things like that, and they think that people should act a certain type of way because they never have dealt with anything like that, and they can't even fathom getting that call. Because let me tell you, thinking, oh, this is what I would do, this is what I would feel, you could think all those things all day long, but that is not how you would actually act. That is not how you would actually feel. That is not the things that you would actually do. 
you have no idea how you would react to getting the phone call that somebody in your life was murdered. Like that is something that is so far beyond something that you would ever expect. I feel like it's unfair to say, oh, well, if I was in that situation, I would ask these questions. I would say these things like you have no idea. You don't know. And it's very easy for people to judge what they don't know. You have no idea. I'm telling you right now, you don't know. The day I found out that my best friend had been murdered, the first question that everybody had asked was, where is the dogs? They wouldn't even tell me what happened. They wouldn't even tell me that he had died until I confirmed that the dogs were at my house and that they were safe. It is a very normal thing to worry about the people that are still living surrounding the area because I hate to say it, but like that person is dead. You can ask for details and yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, the most important thing that you're going to try to get to, the first questions you're going to ask, is everybody else okay? Like, yeah, maybe he could have asked, is my kids okay? Rather than, did they see anything? That's a little weird. But again, you have no idea how you're going to react. You have no clue. So I try to give him a little grace on this. I don't look at him and say, well, you should have asked this question. Like, I know that my thoughts were so far beyond like what I should ask, what I should do the way I should act that it really didn't even matter to me. So I don't look at him and say, well, you should have done this. Any normal person doesn't get a phone call that somebody close to them had been murdered. So one thing that I do find weird, though, like, I get that initial question. Did the kids see anything? I totally understand that. But one thing I do find weird is there was a specific question that OJ never asked what happened. They told him Nicole was dead and he said, did the kids see anything? No. How did it happen? No. Were they? The the first thing that came to my mind was my best friend must have been in a car accident. The furthest thing from my mind was murder. So The fact that he asked, did the kids see anything instead of like, what the hell happened? That's a little weird. Not going to lie. It's a little weird. So now the cops are at OJ's door in Chicago and they notice that he has a cut on his hand. Now, remember, there was a stream of blood leading from the bodies. And initially, they think that that's because the person who killed them got cut while stabbing them. And to be honest, that's actually pretty common. Believe it or not, as much as Hollywood would have you believe that it's so easy and so simple, it is not that easy to stab somebody. A lot of the time, the killer ends up losing their grip on the knife and their hand ends up getting cut from sliding onto the blade as it's going into the person. The things you learn when you have conversations with PIs. So when there's blood drips leading away from the crime scene, the police see that and they're like, all right, the killer must have cut his or her hand. And that makes all the sense in the world because it's a common thing to see at a murder scene. So when they see OJ sitting there and he has a big gash on his hand, plus the fact that they already saw his car covered in blood, they start asking a lot of freaking questions. OJ starts telling them that he cut himself in Chicago, but when they mention the blood on his car, he doesn't really have an answer for that. So now OJ wants to clear his name and he goes down to the police station. He claims he did not kill these two. He had absolutely nothing to do with it. So while he's down there, he hands over a blood sample, thinking it's no big deal. OJ makes the fatal flaw that a lot of people make And that is talking to police without a lawyer. Now, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with him. Like the first conversation that I had with police, I had without a lawyer. I never to this day have ever hired a lawyer. But that's a big but. I also knew from the jump that the person that had killed him was a man. He was 6'2". He was big. Like I knew from the very beginning that there is no way, shape or form that me or any of my people could possibly have had anything to do with this. If there had been any kind of suspicion put on me, even though I know for a fact that I had absolutely nothing to do with this, I can't say I wouldn't get a lawyer. I probably would. So when I say that OJ went to the police station without a lawyer, I'm not saying that he's an idiot for that. A lot of people do that, especially when you're like, well, I know I had nothing to do with this. I had nothing to do with anything. I was completely removed. The last thing you think of is I can't go there without a lawyer. So he's not stupid for doing that. 
So he goes down there. He doesn't have a lawyer. He gives a blood sample. And while he's down there without a lawyer, he's answering questions. But all of these cops are just so like bewildered at the fact that they're meeting OJ Simpson that they don't really ask the hard questions. They don't ask if he killed his wife. They don't ask where he was or when his story starts to switch up, what was the actual story. They don't try to get any actual information out of him. They're just like, oh, Juice, hey, sign my football jersey. Like, they don't do half the things that they would have done if it was a regular civilian being arrested. And that has a huge impact on the rest of the case because they could have gotten some real answers there. And by the time they came back and said, well, now we have these questions, he had already lawyered up. So that's just another example of the LAPD doing their job absolutely horribly for this entire investigation. So now fast forward, OJ now gets himself a lawyer, Robert Shapiro. And he does this because he is the main and number one suspect in this murder. So he lawyers up real quick. Shapiro is doing his best to keep OJ together because he is falling apart. And that's understandable, to be honest. Like, imagine being in his shoes. Like, that's got to be hard. Meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of DNA testing going on. And all of the DNA evidence is leading right back to OJ. The DA decides to hold off on pressing charges until they get confirmation that the DNA evidence and the blood is going to match OJ. But they did not hold off for long. Now, where's OJ during all this drama? He's crashing at Robert Kardashian's house. And I'm guessing that's because the paparazzi has this man's house swarmed 24-7 with media. Kardashian was a friend of OJ's well before the trial, and he ends up becoming one of his defense attorneys, which is probably the thing that made him the most famous in his life. In this time between when the murder occurred and when OJ was officially charged, OJ attended Nicole's funeral, despite him being under investigation for the murder from the moment that she was killed. Only five days after the murder, on June 17, 1994, OJ Simpson was officially charged with the murder of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman. Detectives went to Shapiro because Shapiro is his lawyer, and they let him know that OJ is expected to turn himself in the following morning. Shapiro goes to Kardashian's house, grabs OJ, and there's this whole plan to get him to go into the precinct the next morning. OJ is totally cool with it. It's fine. Whatever. He has no issue turning himself in. He knows he didn't commit these murders. He knows that's going to come out at the end. He knows he's not guilty. Cool. Let's go. I'll turn myself in. Whatever they need for the investigation. The next day comes around and things are not going according to plan. OJ starts acting all kinds of messed up the next day. He is updating his will. He's making phone calls. He's writing these super intense letters. And because of all this craziness and because of who he is, let's be real, he's OJ Simpson. Because he's acting so crazy, the police don't immediately go to get him when he doesn't show up exactly on time. They give him a little bit more time, get him some help, and try to get him to surrender himself. But then noon rolls around and there's no sign of OJ. Instead, he seems to have vanished into thin air, along with his buddy, Al Cowlings. At Kardashian's house, he leaves behind three letters that are all three sealed up tight. Now, the press is already set up and they're camped out at the police precinct waiting for the chance to get a shot of OJ turning himself in at the precinct because he's supposed to be there. By 1.50 p.m., the LAPD is like, all right, enough's enough. We're done giving this guy leeway. And they hold a press conference where they declare OJ Simpson a fugitive and just drop the jaw of everybody in the country. Like everybody remembers this happening. Everybody that was like old enough to understand what was going on remembers this shit happening word for word for word. Like they know where they were when all of these things took place. And just like that, the craziest manhunt ever is on. OJ and Cowlings are on the run and the whole nation is glued to their screens trying to see what's going to happen next in this wild saga. It is now 5 p.m. and Robert Kardashian, OJ Simpson's buddy and his lawyer, steps up to the podium to read a letter from OJ to the press. And this letter is read out live. In this letter, OJ is addressing 24 of his closest friends. 
24. I don't have 24 people that I know, no less 24 of my closest friends, but you know, go off OJ, okay. So 24 of his closest, dearest, most nearest and dearest to his heart friends all get this letter in one fell swoop. All of them are addressed in this one letter. Right off the bat in this letter, he's like, listen, I did not do it. I swear I did not do this. They're accusing me of it. They're saying I did it. They're trying to prove I did it. I did not do it. In this same letter, he spills about his rocky relationship with Nicole. He talks about their fights. He talks about how he decided to call it quits for good. And it wasn't actually Nicole that called it quits. It was him. And he had already moved on. And OJ even has a plea for the media, asking them to lay off of his kids because they're already going through enough. So, like, leave them alone. Pretty much that day and age is like, please respect our privacy. Anytime anything happens to a celebrity, that's the first line you hear out of them. Please respect our privacy. And that's what OJ is doing with this letter, even though he's a fugitive. And that is where the letter stops being normal and starts getting like OD. OJ starts talking about how he can't handle it anymore, dropping lines like, I can't go on. And that's when people start thinking, is this a sewer slide note? The whole scene is really intense. OJ's mom even collapses when she hears it. The media runs with the self-deletion angle, ramping up the search for OJ like crazy. Now, everybody in the country is all over this. Like, there is not a single person in America that is not glued to their screens trying to figure out what the hell is going on. At a press conference, Robert Shapiro backs up the self-deletion theory, saying that he and OJ shrink agree. During this press conference, he basically pleads with OJ to please turn himself in and to end all this madness because him and OJ Shrink both agree that this man has probably gone to delete himself right now, and they don't want to see that happen. Now, let's talk about one of the craziest car chases to ever happen in history, and it all went down on June 17th, 1994 in Los Angeles, California. O.J. Simpson, the former football star and actor, was wanted for the murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. And the entire nation is glued to their TV watching this all unfold. Like, this is the craziest thing that anybody in America had ever seen. It all kicks off when Al Callings, Simpson's buddy, was spotted cruising around in Simpson's white Ford Bronco on the Los Angeles highways. And wouldn't you know it, Simpson is in the passenger seat. Cowlings even makes a 911 call, telling the authorities where he is and that he's not trying to hurt anybody, but letting them know this is an emergency situation. Cowlings gets on the phone with police and lets them know that OJ's in the back of the Ford Bronco, and he said that he was going to unalive himself if Cowlings stopped the car, so he is not stopping. In the backseat with him, he had his revolver, rosary beads, and two framed family photographs. 911, what are you reporting? This is, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. Okay, where are you? Please, I'm coming up the five freeway. Okay. Right now, we all we are okay, but you gotta tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. Is everything else okay? Everything right now is okay, officer. Everything is okay. All about, he wants me to get it to his mom. He wants me to get it to his house. Okay. So that's all I... That's all we ask. He got a gun to his head. Okay, and what, what's your name? My name is AC. You know who I am, goddammit. As the Bronco hit the I-5 freeway, another driver in Orange County tips off cops after they see Simpson in the car. Again, he's in the back, but they see him and the entire nation knows this guy's on the run, so they let authorities know. While all this is going on, Simpson is making calls on his cell phone, which is helping the cops track him down, which I find absolutely wild. Like, I didn't get my first cell phone until like 04. So the fact that it's 1994 right now and this man has a cell phone that he's calling people with, like, I get he was rich, but that's like rich, rich. Like, cell phones weren't really a thing. They were very, very, very basic. They were these bricks. You can see them in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He brings out this like brick of a cell phone. 
There's no such thing as like texting, but it gets the job done and OJ is using it to call his family members from the back of this Bronco. Officer Ruth Dixon spotted the Bronco on Interstate 405 and lets authorities know like, hey, I actually have eyes on this car. While Cowlings is still behind the wheel, he tells Dixon that Simpson is in the back of the car holding a gun to his own head. And like, what do you do in that situation? Like she's driving next to him and they're both driving. And he's like, hey, uh, this guy's in the back of the car. And not only does he have a gun, but it's pointed at his head. Like this is not a good situation. News helicopters from all over the place, like KCBS TV, swooped in to capture scenes from the action below. Zoe Tur, a reporter for KCBS TV, was actually the first one to spot the Bronco from a helicopter. After that point, over nine helicopters joined in. The chase went on and on, and some helicopters even ran out of fuel. Stations had to beg other stations for feeds just to keep the action live. It got so wild that camera signals were popping up on the wrong TV channels. Like, things were so crazy that, like, it seemed like it was the the end of the freaking world. Like nobody knew what was going on, especially the broadcasters on TV. Even sports announcer Pete Arbogast gets involved, connecting Simpson to his old football coach over the phone, which is also broadcast on live news. It was a really emotional moment. And some say that this moment of Arbogast getting Simpson in touch with his old football coach helped prevent something even worse from happening and OJ from actually pulling that trigger. People all over the country were glued to their screens, hoping and praying that Simpson would surrender himself peacefully. Nobody wanted to see him die. Like, even if they did assume that he killed Nicole, nobody wanted to see him die. And everybody was just praying for a safe, end to all this. And everybody is trying to get their 15 minutes of fame with this. Even like big time celebrities are getting on TV to plead with OJ to please surrender himself. Like people like Walter Payton and Vince Evans are both getting on TV like, please choose, please. But I don't know if they even had any kind of like connection with him. I think they just This is the biggest thing going on in the entire country. And if you're not famous enough yet, this will get you there. Detective Tom Lang, who had spoken to Simpson the first time that he was brought in about the murders, gets on the phone with him and starts trying to reason with him. Again, this call is broadcast on the live news. You can hear Lang begging Simpson to toss the gun and come out peacefully for the sake of his family. Simpson seems torn, like he doesn't want to do this, he doesn't want to self-delete, but he also expresses a lot of regret and a desire to see his ex-wife again. Yeah? Just let me get to my house. Please. Okay, we're gonna do that. I swear to you, I'll give you what I, I'll you, give you me, I'll give you my whole body. Uh, okay. I just need to get to my house. Okay. okay. Live with him, call her, uh, we're gonna do that, just throw the gun out the window. I can't do that. We're not gonna bother you, we're gonna let you go up there. Just throw it out the window, please, you're scaring everybody. Toss it, please. Uh, Too many people love you, man. Don't give it all up. Don't hurt everybody. You're going to hurt everybody. I'm just going to leave. I'm just no, going to go with Nicole. That's all I'm going to do. That's all hey, I'm going to do. Think about everybody I else, all right? I couldn't do it on a freeway. I couldn't do it in a field. I want to do it at a grave. I want to do it at my house. You're not going to do anything. Too many people love you. Your uh, kids, your mother, your friends, AC, everybody. you got the whole world. Don't throw it away. Uh, Don't throw it away, man. Come on. OJ? This chase was so big that it even overshadowed the NBA finals. Can you imagine? They had to squeeze in the game into a little corner on the corner of the screen while they covered the chase. The NBA finals, the finals. And while this is all going on, ABC big guns like Peter Jennings and Barbara Walters are on the screen, giving us a rundown and a play-by-play of everything that's happening. Down on the streets, it is a carnival. Thousands of people lined every overpass, cheering Simpson on as he went like he was some kind of hero. And to a lot of people, he was. But not everybody was feeling the hype. 
For most of the people that were watching, this is more than a news story. It's like everybody all of a sudden became actually part of this crazy national drama that's going on. Like, this is no longer just a news story. This is something that is happening to every individual person that's watching it. It's one of those moments that, like, you just had to be there to understand, I guess. Times were so different back then. It wasn't just turning on a TikTok live. Like, the TV was the only source of information and entertainment, and every TV station is taken by this. And it just became literally just, like, a moment in every person's life. Like, most Americans know where they were when JFK was shot and where they were when OJ Simpson was running from the cops in that white Ford Bronco. And it wasn't just Americans that were caught up in this frenzy. People from all over the world were tuning in. People in France and China, they're all watching this go down live. Finally, after hours of this chase, the Bronco rolls up to Simpson's house. The Bronco rolls up and the horde of police officers that are chasing him roll right in behind him, bringing this exciting chase to somewhat of an anticlimactic end. Not that I would have liked to see OJ off himself or anything, but like, I don't know, a a pit maneuver would have been cool. Like, they didn't do anything. They just followed him. Once the white Ford Bronco pulled up to Simpson's Brentwood home, things got even more intense. Now remember, the entire world is watching this go down. And the LAPD already has a very, very bad name. The last thing they want to do is off an American hero live on TV. So this is a very tense situation. From inside the house, Jason, Simpson's son, pops out of the house and he goes over to the car and starts hitting Al Cowlings. Like, you can literally watch Jason beating the shit out of Al Cowlings live on television. It didn't take very long for the cops to run in and grab Jason and arrest him to stop him from interfering. Inside the Bronco, Simpson was reportedly adamant about talking to his mom before he gave himself up. The car sits in the driveway for almost an hour. And later on, a lot of people speculate that they think that OJ was waiting for it to get dark so that when he was arrested, people would be not as easily able to see him being arrested. So that's why he waited as long as he did. But I don't know. Who knows why? Simpson's lawyer, Robert Shapiro, shows up to the scene, and shortly after he arrives, Simpson surrenders and is peacefully taken in. When the cops searched the Bronco after the arrest, they found a whole bunch of stuff. They found cash, a loaded gun, and even a disguise kit with a fake goatee and mustache. Even though all of this stuff that's found in the car could be major evidence against Simpson, the prosecutor, Marsha Clark, decided not to use any of this in court. She thought that the public's reaction to the chase, as well as Simpson's self-deletion note, had already made things way too messy, and she just did not even want to bring that up in court. Which I think is kind of silly because honestly, this is the moment that most Americans got it into their head like, okay, yeah, he probably did it. Like, you don't just go on a cop chase and try to run away and all this stuff if you didn't do it. A lot of people, after this happened, that is what cemented into their head like, okay, yeah, he did it. But if you look at Simpson's trial, the chase is never even mentioned. But looking at the public, their reactions were all over the place. A lot of people were fully convinced that Simpson was guilty, especially after seeing the car chase. But a lot of other people were cheering him on, hoping he would get away with it. So let's dive into the criminal trial of O.J. Simpson for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. And this is going to be a wild ride. (laughs) First up, we've got Simpson's arraignment on June 20th. He obviously pled not guilty to the murders, and he was slapped with no bail, meaning that he was going to be remanded to jail the entire time the case played out in court. The next day, they tried to convene a grand jury to decide whether to indict Simpson, but they had to scrap that plan on June 23rd because the media frenzy was like way too crazy, and they didn't want it to mess with the jury's heads. Now, 
Because of the publicity of this whole thing, instead of a grand jury, they held a probable cause hearing to see if there was enough evidence to send Simpson to trial. On July 7th, the judge gave the green light and approved the case to move forward, saying that there was plenty to go on. Simpson was back in court on July 22nd for his second arraignment. When asked for his plea, he did not hold back, shouting, absolutely, 100% not guilty. As for the witnesses, Jill Shively claimed that she saw Simpson's white Bronco speeding away from the murder scene. Jose Camacho had receipts showing that Simpson had bought a similar knife, but that evidence ended up getting thrown out because something went wrong with the National Enquirer. Rosie Greer said that Simpson had hinted about his involvement in the murders, but that also got tossed out on another technicality. The limo driver, Park, was offered $100,000 by the media to give his story before he gave it on the witness stand, but he ended up turning it down because he didn't want it to compromise his credibility on the stand. As for the defense, they tried to float this theory that there was drug dealers that hired hitmen, but the jury wasn't really buying it. They brought in the neighbor's housekeeper, Rose Lopez, to vouch for Simpson's alibi, but her story didn't really add up, and it kind of ended up doing more harm than good. In the end, this entire case was made up of a messy mix of witness drama, sketchy evidence, real evidence that was thrown out, and legal juggling acts that just made this entire case a freaking joke. The murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman hit the headlines hard, dominating the news for weeks on end. The Los Angeles Times may as well have been named the O.J. Simpson trial completely dedicating itself to this case with front page cover for over 300 days straight. People were already pitching instant books just hours after the bodies were found. The trial itself was like a reality TV show before reality TV even became a thing. The major networks were all over it, giving it more airtime than some major global events combined. We're talking the Bosnian War, the Oklahoma City bombing. The Simpson case beat these events in terms of airtime combined. The media circus got so crazy that it's estimated that the nation lost $40 billion in productivity because everybody was just too busy watching the trial instead of doing their jobs. Prosecutor Marsha Clark was getting attention everywhere she went. People were giving her standing ovations for changing her hairstyle. There were comments about her clothes. There was probably just as much conversation about her style and her appearance as there was about her legal strategy. And it wasn't all good attention. There were front page stories about how Marsha Clark was a bad mother. And one of the top stories the entire time the case went on, almost on a daily basis, was about her hair and how bad it was. The prosecution team was made up of Marsha Clark and William Hodgman, later joined by Chris Darden as co-counsel. They had a whole team behind them, including Hank Goldberg and DNA experts Rockney Harmon and George Woody Clark. And George Clark had no relation to Marsha Clark. And then on the defense side, you have got the dream team of defense attorneys. Johnny Cochran, F. Lee Bailey, and Alan Dershowitz. These guys were already huge deals in the legal world. But the Simpson trial took their fame to a whole new level. Cato Kalin, who was crushing at Simpson's place at the time of the murders, became an overnight sensation, and Faye Resnick and Paula Barbieri both cashed in on their connection to the case by gracing the pages of Playboy. Like, literally, if you had any connection at all whatsoever to this case, you were instantly famous. Judge Lance Ito allowed live cameras to come into the courtroom, which turned the entire trial into a media circus. The trial was all over the news, with over 2,200 segments dedicated to it between 94 and 97. But with great media coverage comes great criticism. Judge Ito got a lot of heat for not keeping the courtroom under control and letting it turn into a spectacle. Now, let's talk about the reporters. There was a spot called Camp OJ, where journalists from all the big news outlets like CBS, AP, and the New York Times set up shop. 
Plus, you had famous writers like Dominic Dunn and Joe McGinnis scoring prime seats in the courtroom. This case turned into the Oscars of reporting. And things took a really scandalous turn when Time Magazine put Simpson on their cover looking darker than usual. People accused them of trying to make him look scarier, and they weren't happy about it. Time ended up issuing a public apology for the entire mess. On the flip side, you've got a newspaper that is pretty well known for putting bullshit out there, the National Enquirer, and they got some props for doing really good investigative journalism. Even Harvard Law bigwig Charles Ogletree gave them a shout out for digging up a lot of legit dirt on the case. Overall, the media would have a huge impact on the entire trial. So obviously, OJ is all about getting this show on the road. He doesn't want to sit in jail while this case goes on. And he requests a speedy trial, and he got what he asked for. The trial kicked off on January 24th, 1995, only seven months after Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were murdered. Court was held in downtown Los Angeles at the C.S. Foltz Criminal Court Building. The trial was supposed to happen in Santa Monica, where the crimes went down. But because of safety concerns after the Northridge earthquake, they moved it to downtown LA. This move had a huge impact, especially when it came to choosing the jury. The jury pool downtown was a lot different than what you would expect to find in Santa Monica. Richard Gabriel, who helped pick the jury for Simpson, noted that the jury from this area were a lot less educated, had lower incomes, and had a lot more African Americans than expected. And that unexpected change had a huge impact on the decision that they would ultimately come to. The makeup of the jury had a huge impact on how they viewed and understood the evidence, like the DNA evidence that was given and arguments about domestic violence. Plus, with more African-American jurors, the defense had a lot better of a shot at swaying opinions about claims of racially motivated misconduct by the police. So now that I've brought that up, let's stop right here and let's go over the racial implications of the O.J. Simpson trial. Before the trial, there was some serious shit going on in the area in terms of like race relations and relations between the community and the police. This trial came on the heels of Rodney King, a man who had been beaten excessively while unarmed and laying on the ground attempting unsuccessfully to protect himself from kicks and nightclub swings that were being lobbed at him from a lot of cops that were surrounding him. After this attack was caught on camera, the police officers that were involved in this beating were put on trial, and when they were found not guilty, riots broke out in all of Los Angeles. The Rodney King case was a seriously divisive case between black and white Americans. People rioting in the streets found whatever white people were nearby and beat them. The most prominent of those attacks being a truck driver who was pulled out of his truck and beaten within an inch of his life for no other reason than that he was white. The police officers who attacked Rodney King were white, and the Rodney King trials shown a huge spotlight on the inequality that African Americans faced at that time when dealing with the police. Another case came into the spotlight that highlighted the inequality that was faced between the African American population and the police and the white population and the police. That trial was Leonard Deadweiler, an African-American man who, I'm just even going to say this before I even explain it, this is the most heart-wrenching thing I think I've ever heard in my life. Like, ugh, it makes me sick to my stomach. So Lawrence Deadweiler, an African-American man, was pulled over after he had run a bunch of red lights and was speeding down the road. When the cop pulled him over, he asked the cop for help. He was speeding because his wife was in the passenger seat in labor, and he asked the cop to help him get to the hospital faster. Now, unknown to Leonard, he had actually been in a police chase. Leonard is actually from Georgia, and in Georgia, when you tie a white cloth to your antenna, it's a sign that you have an emergency. So Leonard had done this. He tied a white cloth to his antenna. So when he had a bunch of cops around him, he thought that he was getting a police escort because it was an emergency. That is not what the police were thinking. And they were attempting to pull him over. And when he didn't pull over, it turned into a police chase. So when he asked the cop, 
to help him get his wife to the hospital faster, the cops shot him in the head at point-blank range, immediately killing him, and his body slumped over onto his wife, who was in labor at the time. The lead defense attorney on OJ's case, Johnny Cochran, was the lawyer that headed up the case that Deadweiler's wife brought against the LAPD, which she lost. Which I think is absolutely asinine. Like, I don't care what color you are, what your background is, whatever. I don't care. Put yourself in that situation. You are in labor. It's a medical emergency and you need to get to the hospital. Your husband is racing you to the hospital and all these cops are around and you think they're there to help because that's what cops are supposed to do. Help. When he stops and talks to the cop, thinking that he's going to get more help, they're going to get out in front of him and clear the way, the cop shoots him at point-blank range. It is the most horrific thing I think I've ever heard. Like, I cannot imagine withstanding that. That is, oh my god, oof, it's so sad. They lost their case against the LAPD because the LAPD claimed that he was moving his car trying to leave. Which made no sense because when he pulled over, he parallel parked. There was a car in front of and in back of him. There was no way that car could have moved. Absolutely no way in the world. But let's be real. She was black. They were white. She lost. And the African-American community had every right to riot over that. And they didn't. It, It raised tensions in the community a lot, but they didn't riot over that. But that was a huge reason that the Rodney King incident led to such violent and horrific riots is because that wasn't the first instance. Cochran also defended Michael Jackson and was a prominent member of the African-American community. He rallied the African-American community behind OJ when he was brought in as the lead defense attorney. Before the trial, citizens were polled and only about 20% of African-American people believed that OJ was guilty of these crimes. And white Americans were exactly the opposite. Only 20% of white Americans believed that he was innocent of these crimes. When the trial began and it was clear that the trial was going to be surrounded with race relations and the divide between white America and black America and the divide between the African-American community and the LAPD, the prosecution brought on a seemingly brand new lawyer, Chris Darden, who just so happened to be African-American. Race relations were drug into this case even more so when the background of Mark Furman was brought up. If you recognize that name, it's because he's the one that I told you was the first person on OJ's property. He's the one who hopped the fence into OJ's house, and he's also the one that located the glove that just so happened to be laying on the side of OJ's house. So Furman decided that he didn't want to be a cop anymore. So he brought a case against the City of Los Angeles Pension Board. And pretty much the whole point of that is to get relieved from duty and get retirement at an earlier age. It's like getting disability from the military. He asked to be relieved from his duties due to a hatred of Black and Hispanic people, or as he put it, Mexicans and N-words. He talks about how he worked in Watts and worked during the Watts riots, and he found that working in that office in that location put him under considerable emotional stress and tension. According to him, his mind had become so poisoned that he had become more violent on the job. He even claimed that he beat up on suspects, claiming no human being can do that job. In preparation for this case to get disability from the LAPD, Furman went and talked to a psychiatrist. He told the psychiatrist that he left the military because of these same groups. During these sessions with the psychiatrists, which were recorded, he uses the N-word no fewer than 40 times during the 13 hours on these tapes. As a result of these problems, in 1975, Furman left the Marines and went almost directly into the LAPD. Furman also just so happens to be the police officer who discovered the glove outside of OJ's house. The psychiatrist's notes state that, His career in the police was similar to his career in the Marines. In both instances, he became bored after five years and wanted out. In the Marines, he had fond memories of killing and beating up people without any ramifications. 
This is how he reminisced about his police career in terms of the suspects that he beat up. He brags about his use of excessive force and goes on at great length about how much fun he had breaking the arms and legs of suspects that gave him a hard time. He also talked shit about a female LAPD officer, the highest ranking woman in the LAPD. She had to discipline him after he had written the letters KKK on a Martin Luther King Jr. poster. He had talked shit to her face, but then later on he went to the psychiatrist and ranted and raved about her there as well, as well as all the other women on the force. He's heard on the tapes saying, they don't do anything. They don't go out there and initiate a contact with some 6'5 N-word who's been in prison seven years pumping weights. McKinney testified that that was the least offensive and inflammatory things that he said on those tapes. The problem with that? That female LAPD officer just so happened to be Captain Margaret York, Judge Ito's wife. Talk about a conflict of interest. She lied to Ito about her connection to Furman so that he would be able to take the case on, but Ito never stepped down from this trial, even after it came out the connection that his wife had to him. The defense tried to get the recorded tapes, where Furman is recorded saying all of this shit entered into evidence, but it was denied. They were only even made aware of these tapes when Simpson's P.I., Patrick McKenna got an anonymous call that tipped him off that these tapes existed, and it's thought that that call came from somewhere inside the LAPD. Now, the issue that I have there is you've got to ask yourself if Ito didn't allow these tapes to be brought into evidence because of the mention of his wife. I don't see that question being posed by anybody else, but it's the first thing that popped into my mind. Did he deny those tapes being entered into evidence because he didn't want to get taken off the trial? He did go a little bit crazy with this shit. Like, there's reports that he would delay the trial in order to give celebrities a personal tour of the courtroom. So this man absolutely did not want to step down from this trial. So was that the result? Him not entering these tapes into evidence? They had to fight tooth and nail to even get their hands on these tapes in the first place, with the judge blocking them when they went to North Carolina to request these tapes, but they filed an appeal and they won shortly after. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty surprised that these tapes were able to be even acquired in the first place. Isn't there some kind of, like, doctor-patient confidentiality when it comes to psychiatrists? Like, I know that they can get on the stand and testify as to, like, your mental state and shit like that, but I didn't know that the actual conversations that you have with them can be recorded and then used against you later. Like, that's absolutely wild. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy they did. The shit that he said in those tapes was absolutely vile, and the world is a much better place for having these tapes come out. And he even ended up in jail over these tapes. We'll go over later why he ended up in jail. It wasn't because of, like, the stuff that was said in the tapes itself, but it should have been. He had already resigned from the LAPD in 1995, so it's not like these tapes got him taken off the streets, but he absolutely deserved to be put in jail for the shit that he said and did on those tapes. And it definitely does shine a huge light on whether or not the evidence that he collected was legit or not. This was also not the first time that Furman had any interactions with OJ. He had been the police officer that responded to one of those eight calls that Nicole had made to the police regarding the domestic violence that OJ was beating her. Furman states that he would have arrested OJ on that call, but she adamantly declined to press charges or even file a report. Since the tapes weren't allowed into evidence, Cochran and the defense team brought even more proof that Furman was racist and would do absolutely anything to get a conviction on those he deems guilty. They brought a witness up that said that during a traffic stop, a black man drove by with a white woman in the passenger seat And Furman started going wild about how it was unconstitutional that a black dude would be with a white girl, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. The whole point of this is they need to assassinate Furman's character so that they could make it plausible that he would go and he would plant the glove to make OJ look guilty, which I personally, I fully believe. He found the glove seven and a half hours after the murder, and the blood on the glove was still wet and moist. F. Lee Bailey questioned Furman on the stand, 
said that any glove that was sitting outside would dry up in that amount of time. And the only way that they would be able to keep that glove still moist with the blood that was on it would be to seal it in plastic. Like, if he found that glove at the scene of the crime, or another officer found the glove at the scene of the crime, put it in a bag, and then planted it at OJ's house. According to F. Lee Bailey, this is the only thing that would keep that glove moist. Now, starting off the actual trial, Judge Lance Ito had his work cut out for him. They interviewed over 300 potential jurors who had to fill out a massive 75-page questionnaire. It was also a huge factor that the entire jury was sequestered for almost an entire year. Sequestered means that you literally go to court, go back to a hotel room, and that is it. You don't talk to anybody. You aren't allowed to talk to your fellow jury members. You aren't allowed to watch TV. You are cut off from the rest of the world for a year. One of the questions when they were choosing the jury was whether being sequestered for that huge amount of time would have a negative impact on their life. And you got to ask yourself, like, who are the people who would be able to say no to this more easily? The answer is usually people that have jobs that have little to no accountability. People who make very low income and don't have employees depending on them. These little factors have a huge impact on choosing the jury. And it also had a huge impact on the verdict. By November 3rd, they finally had their 12 jurors and 12 alternates ready to go. Throughout the trial, they had to say goodbye to 10 jurors for various reasons. So it's a really good thing they had 12 alternate jurors. I wonder what would have happened if like they lost 13 and then they only had 11. Like what, what do you do in that situation? By the end of the trial, only four of the original jurors were left standing. When choosing the jurors, the prosecution and defense had very different strategies when it came to picking them. Marsha Clark thought that women, no matter their race, would be sympathetic to Nicole Brown Simpson because of the domestic violence angle. But the defense thought differently, especially when it came to black women and interracial marriages. One of the first jurors to be kicked out was juror Jeanette Harris, who was let go after Judge Ito found out that she hadn't disclosed a domestic violence incident. Harris accused the deputies of racism, sparking major tension amongst the jurors. It got so heated that 13 of them refused to return to court until they talked to Judge Ito about it. When they did finally go to court, they showed up wearing all black, like they were attending a funeral. And if I'm being honest, it seems like the judge and the lawyers, they weren't the only ones that were taking advantage of the theatrics of this court proceeding. The prosecution story goes like this. They argued that the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were the tragic result of a history of violence between O.J. Simpson and Nicole. They pointed to O.J.'s past abuse and a rocky relationship that ended in divorce with Marguerite. Now, on the night of the murders, things took a turn. O.J. had been at his daughter's dance recital, where he reportedly got upset over Nicole's outfit and got into it with her. Then, to make matters worse, he got a voicemail from his girlfriend, Paula Barbieri, calling it quits. According to the prosecution, OJ headed over to Nicole's place in his Ford Bronco, hoping to patch things up. When things didn't go as planned, they say that he snapped and ended up killing Nicole, and then killed Ron to cover his tracks, because he showed up with the glasses. After the murders, the prosecution claimed that OJ ran back home, ditched his bloody clothes, and changed into fresh ones before catching a limo to the airport. Then, they say he dumped the evidence at the airport before getting on the plane and heading to Chicago. The prosecution kicked off their case with a chilling 911 call from Nicole Brown Simpson back in 1989. She's scared for her life, and you can hear OJ in the background yelling. This incident led to OJ's arrest, an eventual plea deal for domestic violence. The jury was even able to see pictures of Nicole's injuries from that night. But it does not stop there. Ron Shipp, a longtime friend of both OJ and Nicole, as well as an LAPD police officer, drops a bombshell. He testified that OJ told him that he had dreams about killing Nicole. He even said that that's why OJ did not want to take a lie detector test because he had dreams of killing her. So he was convinced that he would fail the lie detector test. The defense tried to discredit him, saying that he's just out for fame, but it didn't seem like the jury was buying it. According to them, he seemed pretty sincere. 
That is not how Ship tells it, though. In a documentary, Ship makes it clear that he was kind of hung out to dry and that there was a lot of people that were supposed to testify after him that ended up pulling out and not testifying because of how bad Ship was just destroyed on the stand. Ship says that his character was assassinated and that he was just like pretty much made out to be a complete asshole. And the thing that kind of bothers me is that he's on this documentary and he's like, oh, I can't believe that OJ would do that to me. Like, it's it's clear that he has no loyal... Like, bitch, you're testifying against him trying to get him put in jail. Like, come on, man. You can't understand why he would, like, assassinate your character when you're up there saying, like, hey, uh, he, he killed that girl. Like, I get it, you know? He's not just gonna, oh, that's my friend, so I'm not gonna say anything negative. Let's just let him put me in jail. Like, fuck that. But yeah, according to Ship, like, he got destroyed on the stand. So after Ship took the stand... Nicole's sister was up next. She recounted multiple instances of domestic violence that she witnessed between OJ and Nicole. She even says that OJ was agitated on the night of their daughter's dance recital, which was the same night that Nicole was murdered. The prosecution even planned to show evidence of 62 separate incidents of domestic violence, including letters that Nicole wrote about the abuse. But Judge Ito ended up putting a stop to that, saying only witnessed accounts can be presented. It's clear that they're trying to paint a picture of a very volatile relationship that ended in tragedy. The prosecution's entire case is built on showing how OJ's pattern of violence toward Nicole, beating her up, like just constantly beating on this girl, all led to the tragic events that took place that night. I find it wild that testimony of the person that's murdered cannot be entered into the murder trial because you can only include things that had been witnessed. And that's so not fair. Like, you should have the ability to testify at your own murder trial. If she went and wrote these diary entries and said, like, I know he's going to kill me, like, that should absolutely be entered into court. She told multiple people that she was being beat, that he was going to kill her, she went all over the place with it. And it just wasn't entered into evidence because nobody witnessed it actually happen. It doesn't matter that she said it directly to them because they didn't see it actually happen. It didn't get entered, which is just all kinds of fucked up, if you ask me. Okay, everybody, that is where I'm going to stop tonight's episode. We've gone through a lot today, and I just don't really want to like overwhelm you guys and make it so that I'm just like droning on and on. So I hope you guys enjoyed part two and plan to come back for part three of the OJ series. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, comment, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye.